Um, um, so it's been now uh, one one year that we uh, decided, that Eduardo and I, to uh, join the forces, uh, not only having the same name, but also a common <laughs> interest. <laughs> so if you know some people whose name is Eduardo, Edward, uh, or something uh, there, we'll be happy to, to welcome them in the club. Um, I should be... I'm supposed to uh, finish my speech now on the basis on the, uh, the, the program, so I'll be trying to be as, as synthetic as possible. I just wanted uh, you to know that actually um, this uh, article I wrote is part of a, a much larger opus, which is a handbook on uh, European taxation that uh, we are uh, will be publishing uh, in 2020 uh, and which has been uh, uh, co-directed by uh, Werner Haslener who is here, Christiana Panayi and uh, myself and there are 27 chapters on different issues on European taxation including uh, a large chapters on effect on third country and, and global uh, relationships. So ju that is just uh, a teaser uh, of um, larger uh, work. Well, um, the scope of the talk today uh, is not too much to dig into all the details of the case law of the European Court of Justice and uh, EU directive, but more to try to understand whether there has been a shift in the way um, European legislation is adopted and in the way European Court of Justice is interpreting uh, European legislation caused by this uh, global trend that we've been discussing uh, today, uh, which is basically connected to the OECD uh, BEPS uh, action plan. And um, my um, answer, provisional, but uh, I'm rather sure about it, it's uh, the fact that there, is a, there has been actually a shift also in the interpretation of existing concepts. So it's not just about creating new rules. We had, for example, at the EU level, a directive implementing uh, partly, partially the, the BEPS action plan. But also if we look at the interpretation of very well-known concepts of international and European uh, tax law, uh, like um, territoriality and abuse, we can see uh, the influence of um, BEPS. Um, I would add that within the European concept, this uh, context, these concepts have um, a quite an ambiguous function because you never know um, if you speak about territoriality <coughs> and abuse from a European perspective or, for, or, or from a domestic perspective of the member states. And sometimes the European idea of territoriality can conflict with the domestic idea of territoriality, the domestic meaning uh, territoriality of the tax system of the uh, member states. So territoriality in international tax law can mean uh, many things. I won't uh, spend too much time on that. Um, if you look at uh, EU law, um, if you stick to the idea of territoriality from a European perspective, you find that, but only in indirect tax legislation. Uh, customs duty, of course, we've got a, a customs territory. We've been discussing that a lot uh, uh, with uh, uh, the UK lately. Uh, you can be part of the uh, EU uh, customs and even VAT territory without being part of the EU. That's something that um, uh, our uh, uh, friends from the UK will discover very soon, um, which means that you can leave without uh, leaving, um, and uh, it's a <laughs> nice feeling that they will have uh, very, very soon. Um, direct taxation is a bit different. We do not have at the moment a true European <coughs> territory. We've got the territorial system, uh, or at least the member state tax system which applies territorially on the uh, territory of the uh, member states. And okay, so when it comes to um, territoriality, it's not just, uh, uh, let's say, a political uh, concept, it is also 
uh, a legal concept that has been used in uh, EU uh, case law. And it has been used in um, a rather particular uh, way because under territoriality, the uh, European Court of Justice has basically allowed member states to justify violations of European fundamental rules, uh, the fundamental freedoms of uh, movement. Uh, sometimes territoriality has been accepted in earlier legislation, um, has, has been accepted as a justification, sometimes it has been rejected. It's interesting to notice that there is uh, 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 quite a uh, clear trend toward a uh, larger um, uh, uh, justification based on territoriality, uh, especially if we look at, for example, uh, uh, losses or uh, exit taxes. Uh, it seems that uh, the court has clearly accepted the right of a member state, and I quote, the right of a member state to exercise its power of taxation in relation to activities carried out on its territory. And on that basis, uh, the court has accepted uh, domestic anti-avoidance uh, measure. If we turn to um, abuse, why do I address both concepts? Because actually there has been a gradual uh, shift in the case law of the court uh, aiming at joining the idea of territoriality with the idea of, of abuse in a, a single set of uh, justification, which uh, does not uh, help when you analyze uh, the different types of, uh, of justification, but clearly indicates that uh, the court is more willing to take into account the, uh, the, the fiscal interests uh, of uh, the member states and uh, um, merging um, territoriality and uh, abuse the court has developed a justification like uh, what it has called the balance allocation of uh, taxing power but before discussing the, the merging uh, one word some words about the uh, prohibition of abuse uh, under EU law to show you that there has been also a shift in the interpretation of that concept, which dates back before the BEPS uh, uh, period, so early uh, 2000, uh, has been developed in VAT, then in direct tax, um, and which be at the beginning was limited as uh, to purely artificial activities, with the idea that uh, if taxpayers engaged in activities that are purely artificial, they shouldn't benefit from the protection of um, EU law. What we have uh, noticed uh, later on is that um, the court and the European legislature has um, moved from this requirement of artificiality. Uh, basically has moved from the idea that you had to look at the single behavior of the uh, taxpayer and has adopted a more, um, let's say, objective um, point of view, which is more based on the potential risk of abuse and not on the <coughs> reality of uh, abuse. An interesting trend that we've noticed is that um, abuse now is not just a way of uh, justifying uh, violation of fundamental freedoms, but um, prohibition of abuse has become in EU law uh, an obligation for states. Uh, now member states under EU uh, legislation and under the case law of the court um, not only are authorized to apply their anti-avoidance measures in case of abuse, but they are required to do so. And that's a trend that, is, that can clearly be connected to uh, the implementation of uh, uh, BEPS. So for example, uh, we have uh, adopted in 2016 an anti-tax avoidance directive and an article six with a general anti-avoidance measure which creates an obligation for member states to um, fight against abuse and not only abuse of European law, 
but also abuse of purely domestic law, uh, which is quite uh, peculiar considering from a purely legal perspective that you have an obligation by an international organization to pursue abuse of your own domestic legislation. Uh, and uh, it's not just a faculty, it's uh, an uh, obligation. Same thing with uh, a rather recent case law of 26 of February 2019 about the application of directives that have been <coughs> interpreted by the court as obliging um, uh, member states to deny the application of the benefits of directives which basically exempted from withholding tax on interest and dividends outgoing uh, flows to deny the application of those directives implicating which was not self-evident an obligation to tax those flows uh, if the ultimate beneficiary of those flows was a non-European uh, company. Uh, so uh, a strengthening in this um, concept and interpretation of uh, abuse. And that raises um, a number of questions. Um, first of all, whether those two concepts, territoriality and abuse, are really uh, um, fit to be used as benchmarks to test uh, the domestic anti-avoidance measure, or more generally, uh, domestic measures and whether we shouldn't, as some uh, advocate, uh, move towards another type of concept, which is the concept of coherence, uh, which has the advantage of being more neutral as regards this uh, objective of fighting against tax evasion, of protecting the tax base. It would simply allow uh, the uh, Court of Justice to test whether there is consistency, coherence, in the domestic uh, legis legislation <coughs> and how far must uh, a court whose goal is basically to ensure that there is freedom of movement uh, within the European Union, how far should a court go, go, go to promote other types of objectives such as uh, the prevention of abuse. Uh -huh. I remember, I recall that at the beginning, the idea was the prevention of abuse was an exception to this general principle, not it has become a general principle as such, uh, which means that it has an influence on the interpretation of all uh, the areas of European uh, tax uh, law. And um, the, the ultimate question is whether under those concepts, territoriality, abuse, coherence, whether the courts influence the allocation of taxing powers between member states, um, and which indirectly would have as a consequence that you would have uh, at European law the exercise of a disguised competence that has been uh, clearly excluded uh, by uh, the treaty, uh, that's uh, uh, something I will. Uh, that's uh, something for for future uh, research. But to to sum up the uh, the idea of uh, this paper uh, is to show that uh, starting from concepts that are relatively different from each other, um, that um, if you study the evolution of European law, you can see that they've been merged into. Uh, kind of, of new concept which has a rather large influence of the objectives of European integration um, as such. And on that, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. For Alice Pirlot, who is a yes. fellow University of Oxford. She's originally from Belgium. Yes, and uh, originally the PhD students of Eduardo Traversa. <laughs> so it's a real privilege to be here today. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for the invitation <coughs> for this great event. I really enjoyed uh, all the presentation. And I also enjoyed reading Eduardo's paper. So thank you. I will not come back on all those questions because I'm, I don't think I'm the right person to answer them. And I also don't want to come back on all the details of the paper. What I would like to do is to sort of broaden the scope of the paper 
Because the challenge of Eduardo was to explain the interactions between the concept of territoriality and abuse and how they evolved. And he showed that shift and the new trend, clearly, in my opinion, even though it wasn't an easy task. Because when you think about those two concepts, territoriality and abuse, probably your first impression could be that they have nothing to do with each other. So it's quite interesting to see this shift under EU law where you see those two concepts coming um, towards each other. And as Eduardo explained, in EU law, probably also in international tax law, they've been used in different contexts with different purposes. So he showed all the evolution, the evolution of those two concepts through the case law of the Court of Justice. You could also look at um, positive law, so all the directives, etc. So that's very interesting. But what I'd like to do now is to add some more complexity. So I'd like, I'd like to add one additional context, maybe one additional purpose for those two concepts, so as to show how they interact in this additional um, context. And the con context I'm, I'm thinking about is the context of uh, the external strategy of the European Union with regard to um, this tax agenda. So when you look at this additional context, you see that also territoriality and abuse come into play in European tax law, maybe in a way that's a little different. And the document I've, I've looked at to, to prepare this, this idea, this approach, is the communication of the Commission released in 2016 on this EU external uh, strategy for effective taxation. And when you read this document, you can really see that the EU is trying to extend the application of EU law and its approach to fiscal abuse beyond the European borders. In its communication, the, communi the Commission is very clear that it's trying to expand its influence on search countries. And I'll just give you two quotes from that document because they nicely illustrate this point. So the first quote is the following. The communication identifies the key measures which can help the EU to promote tax good governance globally, tackle external base erosion threats, and ensure a level playing field for all businesses. And later in the document, there is another quote. And it says, and there are many, many other quotes that I could choose from because <laughs> the document is full of those references where they really insist on the fact that they're trying to extend the territorial scope of application of EU law. So the second quote is the following. In its work to promote tax good governments go globally, the EU should encourage its international partners to also adopt these higher standards, which are applied within the single market. And I'll stop here, but again, I could give you many other examples. So in fact, this phenomenon, this phenomenon of extending the territorial scope of EU law is not specific to EU tax law. It's a more general phenomenon that has been studied under general EU law. And here I'd like to refer to Professor John, Joanne Scott from the University College of London, because she has been studying this phenomenon that she calls the territorial extension of EU law. And in a paper that was published in, I think, the American Journal of Comparative Law, she looks at 10 examples where you see this extension. So for example, she takes the aviation directive and she explains how the EU is trying to reach beyond the activities of airlines as it's taking place uh, on above the EU territory. <coughs> and I think what's interesting here is that what you've been analyzing could actually serve as a, an 11th example of this phenomenon. So the EU is trying to reach beyond its own borders by expanding the, 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 the influence of EU tax law. And I believe that this dim dimension is important because it could actually reconcile one of the conflicts that Eduardo nicely explained in, in his paper, namely the dichotomy that could arise between, on the one hand, the internal market and the objective of removing all the fiscal borders, and on the other hand, the <laughs> member state financial interest. So with the external strategy, what the EU is doing is actually to portray itself as a big fiscal union bloc. And that's interesting because <coughs> if we start moving towards this fiscal union bloc, if we start moving towards the fiscal union, basically <laughs> you no longer face 
the risk that this conflict will arise simply because member state financial interests more likely would align with the union interest. The last point I'd like to mention that's actually maybe st stressing this, this point of the EU expanding its scope and also moving towards a fiscal union is the very recent political guidelines of uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the um, president-elect for the European Commission. So when you read the political guidelines, and I'm sure that many of you have, have done so, there is one proposal that I find very interesting, and I'm very, very biased, so I have to admit that. <laughs> she, she proposes a border carbon tax. And that's interesting because I'm not sure that the European Union would be able to adopt a border carbon tax without fully harmonizing taxation on energy products. And if that's true, and if she manages to introduce this tax, which is unlikely, probably, but who knows, then that would mean that would we would have one of the first genuine European tax and maybe that would be one first step towards the fiscal union fully reconciling the, um, the conflicts that you've been putting forward in the paper. So that's, that's my contribution. Um, I hope it helps maybe, it, you know, encourage you to write another paper <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on this topic, expanding its, its territorial <laughs> <laughs> scope. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, it's my turn already. Yes. I thought I'm the third. <laughs> So we are on time. I'm delighted. So we are following the schedule. Perfect. Okay, I follow the tradition of everyone coming up here. Yeah. It's <laughs> more more formal than I thought this was going to be even as a as a as a commenter commentator. So thanks very much for having me as well. <coughs> it's great to see Eduardo's uh, paper presented here. That, as he's already pointed out. Um, I can hardly criticize it being one of the co-editors of the <laughs> book where it's going to be published. So I think my main comments that I'm going to make are essentially partly something that Eduardo has already covered in the presentation now and that is not yet uh, fully reflected in the paper because this area is moving so fast that by the time it, the paper was finished, since then we have had a couple of months and therefore a number of um, relevant and rather important uh, judgments in the area both of abuse and of territoriality. <coughs> the one thing that um, Eduardo already mentioned, the case law from February this year, the so-called Danish cases or invariably also called the beneficial ownership cases concerning a number of uh, cases uh, involving uh, entities from uh, Denmark and some in Luxembourg, etc., where Essentially, the claim was that third parties, uh, third country resident companies used uh, uh, the benefits of the directive in an abusive manner in order to gain basically access to, to the European market. And the court seems there in a way that I see this sort of the, the aspect that you mentioned. It's almost completing the, the arc of development of the uh, abuse of law uh, jurisprudence that has started in the area of, of indirect tax. And where it has now declared uh, a self-standing principle that that cannot be tax abuse. It used to be you cannot abuse EU law, but now it seems to be going further than that. You cannot abuse, you cannot use even domestic law for abusive ends if somehow that leads to a result that the European legislature would not have wanted, <coughs> even though they did not explicitly prohibit that in the legislation that they had. So what's quite striking about this is that used, we used to think of EU directives generally as being relieving for taxpayers, in particular in the direct tax area, and that has a lot to do with the competence basis that the European Union has to adopt uh, these uh, types of uh, legislation because it doesn't actually have a direct tax competence as such. So therefore it adopts directives in order to relieve primarily the burden of double taxation. That's what the purpose of all those directives were. And then they used to have, they have their 
anti-abuse clauses in there, which are essentially opening clauses and giving member states the possibility to prevent an abuse of these um, of these directives. But a directive itself was never understood to be binding on a taxpayer, and according to also lots of cases outside the tax area, it wouldn't be to the extent, so it couldn't be directly applied to burden the tax to the individual. It could only burden the member state who fails to implement it properly. And now in those Danish cases, the court seems to go beyond that and uh, without mentioning it against, uh, well, it does mention it. It's rather uh, unconvincing distinguishes it from its earlier case law in Kofut, arguing that, well, in Kofut, I may have said that you can implement such an opening clause also by way of a general principle, but in fact, even that's not even necessary. Even if you have no national rule that implements that opening anti-abuse clause in a directive, anyway, you have to deny a benefit in an abusive situation. And that's somewhat puzzling, but I think Eduardo correctly uh, identified it may have to do with the whole uh, politics element around it that we face perhaps that we have had the European legislature in the meantime adopting a directive which binds member states to prevent abuse. Now, of course, that was not an issue in this case and sh therefore shouldn't play a role, but it certainly adds something to the flavor in that. So that's the one element that's somewhat surprising puzzling. The, the other uh, recent case law that relates to the issue of territoriality more directly rather than, um, rather than uh, abuse is the case law from November last year in the uh, case called Sofina that concerned UK companies investing in, in French companies and receiving dividend payments from those French companies where France um, wanted to levy a withholding tax. Well, the international tax rules perfectly fine, perfectly appropriate, nothing wrong with that. What the English company said was, well, but I don't actually have a profit overall. <coughs> I mean, an overall loss situation. And therefore, France, please don't tax me. Because if I were a French company, you wouldn't actually tax me on dividends until I have actually a profit. That seems perfectly reasonable at, at, as a starting point. The problem with that is that this <coughs> The ruling of the court, which <coughs> essentially agreed with the, the claim by the uh, British company, is saying, well, yes, indeed, because you had a loss, you shouldn't be taxed in France either at this point when you receive a dividend, because overall you have no ability to pay. The problem with that is that it means that the British companies were able to import or to export their losses that they had into the source country, France. And that seems very much at odds, not only with case law that we have uh, considered to be um, consistent and unchallenged since the 90s in the uh, Futura participation case where the court had explicitly accepted the principle of territoriality as a basis of international tax system that cannot be challenged by the uh, European freedoms which says in this case well if you are non-resident you will be subject to tax only on your territorial income in the source state and not on anything else. So whatever happens outside the source state, including your worldwide losses that you may have, are completely immaterial. That's what the court would have held and that's what we would have expected here as well. But the court didn't even mention that, didn't refer to that earlier case law and simply accepted that in those circumstances, it's not quite clear why, the, uh, the uh, taxpayer would be able to import losses into the source state. That is even at odds very much to the long established and consistent case law on the other side where it say, well, if you're a resident state, you do not have to grant relief for losses that are generated in the source state unless and up to, uh, until the point when you can show that actually those losses are final. So basically there's no chance that they will ever be taken into account in the source state where they arose. So in that respect, the court still seems to, s if it still follows that, which we don't know, we imagine that it will still um, follow the territoriality principle from that, from that uh, side, but not in this side. So that's two puzzling developments that we see, um, and that really leave me, and I think maybe you as well, maybe Eduardo, you already have it all figured out, somewhat at a loss as to where the court is, is really going there, 
um, in terms of recognizing territoriality. Mm -hmm. um, one uh, yeah, concrete uh, point that I had, I think, Eduardo, you, you, you mentioned in your paper the possibility that uh, mm, we move from a wholly artificial requirement in abuse uh, possibly towards a different one where we reflect economically reality but you also said that should be distinguished you call it a somewhat disturbing feature in your paper of the, the fact that in the anti-tax avoidance directive we no longer talk about wholly artificial arrangements but rather refer to um, economic reality genuineness of valid commercial reasons and such and I think you point out uh, quite uh, justifiably that this creates some uncertainty which seems even inconsistent with the court's own case law where it concerns member states uh, anti-abuse rules. Now that may be a bug but it may also be a feature I think of the whole thing because the, the court essentially could say first of all if it's European legislature we, have, we grant a broader margin of discretion as it generally does in these sort of things so basically the EU can uh, is not bound by the same <coughs> level of uh, 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 certainty, doesn't have to achieve that. Secondly, the court would of course still be free to say that the directive is valid, and there's no problem with that. But I to the extent that uncertainty arises, it may arise from an insufficiently clear transposition of the directive in member states' laws, and thereby it could still upheld taxpayers' uh, right to certainty without having to to declare the, the asset itself problematic and that's particularly I think uh, made possible because of the way article 6 paragraph 3 works which allows which leaves member states basically full discretion on the tax consequences that they apply to the finding of an abusive arrangement so if they are there not <coughs> clear enough the court could simply say well you can apply article 6 but the consequences that you apply to that are not in line with my case law in Seattle and Etikon, therefore there's a problem. Yes, uh, then your paper seems to suggest, and I think also your presentation to a certain extent, that the idea of coherence might be a solution to the out of the conundrum of, of, of dealing with uh, territoriality on the one hand, abuse on the other side. <coughs> I think that's, I would, I would like it very much, but I would just say there's certainly no uh, panacea the court, for example, in the Sofina case, did not analyze coherence at all, which it should have done. Um, and it found also a somewhat novel approach to the balanced allocation of taxing rights as a, as, a, as a way to solving that. So I think it hasn't really quite figured out what coherence is su supposed to be, apart from the fact that that notion of coherence has shifted, has changed its meaning over its case over the last 15 years already as well. So I think that's... Uh, the main thing there. I think I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Two minutes. Two minutes. Um, yeah, the point on Korean rents, you, you, you're right. Uh, since uh, the Sofina case, I think uh, the case of the court is less coherent, uh, which is uh, something I will have to sort out. Um, the territoriality, extraterritoriality of EU law in tax, uh, tax matters is. Uh, a reality, and uh, I think it will increase uh, with time. With uh, when the EU will negotiate international agreements, all, all also not related to taxation, um, it uh, will happen more and more often that it insert a good tax governance clause. It has been the case now with uh, uh, financial flows, uh, investments. Uh, the use <coughs> of uh, tax havens for uh, EU funds to uh, EU development funds. Um, uh, it's 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 a trend that will be uh, increasing. Same time, same thing. But the question is whether <coughs> one, whether the EU has got a legal basis to do so, and whether it will reach a unanimous uh, agreement of the member states to have a, a, a carbon tax, which would imply also a harmonized energy tax uh, at the uh, at the at the EU level but that will so all certainly have an extraterritorial uh, impact on on that so uh, I definitely agree something that we have to to watch <coughs>
Thank you very much. Can, uh, can I say one, one more web since it was just one minute? Yes. I had one, <laughs> one comment to, to the point of extraterritoriality, which I think what you both describe is, in my view, not, not really extraterritoriality of the law. Maybe to the, to the extent that we can see it in, in actual agreements, and we also have that example of trade agreements where the, uh, where the European Union tries to expand much of its law. But more broadly, I think what Elise described is really an export of EU tax policy, which is less problematic in my view, because you know if you have a policy, you may well expand that. Mm -hmm. In terms of law relative to third countries, the European legislature has been quite differential, in particular to tax treaties, by normally accepting or uh, making exception, in particular in rules like the ATAD and uh, CCDB, situations where member states have concluded tax treaties, and they were saying, well, in those cases, those rules may not apply. Yes. So I think that's just as a caveat, we, while I fully appreciate <coughs> your, 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 your comment. May, may I react? <laughs> so, 30 Other seconds. Minutes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I use the term ex um, territorial extension on purpose to distinguish it from extraterritorial application, mm -hmm. because that's also what Joan Scott does, and I think it's a very clever distinction. Mm -hmm. She also does this in comparisons to the US approach, where the idea of extraterritoriality is much more, um, is much stronger. Mm. Um, so I agree with you. I'm, yeah, I, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much.